was going to share first. Yeah. That's one of the I reasons I brought Amit on. He's much better at the technological aspects of this. Thank you so much. I'm just going to uh, start with introductions uh, now that the neonatal unit has also joined us. So I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers today, speaking to us at uh, the network, as well as uh, to the participants of our module and grid trainees. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Carl Bax, who uh, works in Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio and uh, leads perinatal research and has actually got a research interest uh, around uh, pediatric cardiology. That's one of my loves as well, as well as working uh, as uh, and doing a lot of research around management of extremely preterm babies. So uh, the articles that we discussed in the last session, uh, all three of them on active versus selective approach, uh, obviously have been authored by Carl. So it's a real honor to be able to have him. Alongside him, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Omid Fati, uh, who works along with Carl uh, as a uh, in the Division of Neonatology at Nationwide Children's Hospital, who will be speaking to us on the clinical aspects. Uh, so I'd like to welcome both of you. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor over to you, mute myself. Sounds great. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. It, it truly is an honor for both of us to be here. Um, I promise you we're going to learn as much from you guys as we do from, uh, from us. So we have no disclosures. Um, let me just move this a little bit. I've got so many cameras, I never wish, uh, know which one to look at. But Dr. Fathi and I really want to share our perspective um, in the care of mother-infant diets at 22 and 23 weeks gestation. Um, you know, before we delve too far into this topic, I think all of us need to acknowledge that th this discussion on perinatal care at the limits of viability is highly complex. Medically, what outcomes should we measure to define success? And that definition is going to change based on social, personal, religious, and cultural perspectives. I do think that we can all agree that our goals are, are really twofold. We want to minimize the under-treatment where the provision of care would have made a positive impact on an infant's survival and meaningful existence, and then minimize over-treatment, where that level of neurodevelopmental impairment, even in the face of possible survival, really is too great. For the purposes of today's discussion, let's define the limits of viability as the gestational age at which a newborn has a 50-50 chance of survival. It's a crude um, definition, but it's something that's pretty prevalent in the literature. There's been a marked lowering of the bar, so to speak, over the past 50 years. Back in the early 80s, um, the limit of viability was 26 to 27 weeks. And today, the limit of viability in some centers, and many um, perhaps uh, that you've already talked with in Sweden, Iowa, and elsewhere, is closer to 22 weeks. So here are the few points uh, that we'd like to cover today. Let's try to start this conversation by moving beyond gestational age to consider additional factors that influence short and long-term outcomes. Let's explore some of the contemporary American College of Obstetricians and American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines in this area, recognizing it's a little US centric and that we can um, and are looking towards um, other countries for guidance as well. Let's re review contemporary data on mortality and morbidity at 22 and 23 weeks gestation. Let's highlight this ongoing discordance in care among our neonatal and obstetrical providers. And finally, let's suggest, and I underscore suggest, a possible clinical paradigm to guide our care. So let's start with that first point of moving beyond gestational age. What is one of the first questions when all of us are faced with a mother at, uh, with preterm labor? Right? What is the gestational age of the fetus? On the right, we must define a patient population that is too big or too mature, a level of a maturity that would, all of us would agree that active intervention, we're gonna define that later, is warranted. On the other hand, there must be a patient population that's too small or too immature where providing resuscitation and utilizing medical resources would, would be perhaps futile or unreasonable. That group should be provided comfort care. In between the too small and the too big is this gray zone. 
where survival and long-term outcomes are difficult to predict and almost impossible to apply to our individualized patients. This gray area is where, we, where medical decisions are complex. Traditionally, assignment of patients into similar models like this hinge solely on gestational age, but several factors beyond gestational age need to be carefully considered, right? Let's talk about a few of those factors today. The first one is the big four, moving beyond gestational, out, moving beyond gestational age. What are the four factors that also influence short and long-term outcomes? Let's look at the inaccuracies of gestational age dating. Let's look at our ability or lack thereof to discriminate survivors versus non-survivors based on their clinic clinical condition of birth and the impact of the, the delivery setting. This was an article published in the New England Journal that included over 4,000 infants born at 22 to 25 weeks of gestation. The goal of the paper was to relate risk fact factors accessible at or before birth to the likelihood of survival and survival without profound neurodevelopmental impairment. The authors observed that infants who were exposed to antenatal corticosteroids, were female, were singleton, and had a higher birth weight per 100 gram increments above expected were each. Each one of those factors were associated with a reduction in the risk of death and the risk of death or profound neurodevelopmental impairment. Most importantly, these reductions were similar to those associated with a one week increase in gestational age. When I speak with pediatric residents and neonatology fellow, fellows, I refer to these factors as the big four. I think it's important for people in our neonatal community to be aware of the wide variability and the accuracy of dating using gestational age when the ultrasound is performed, particularly in that second or third trimester. Look at the wide variance there. We need to be cognizant of both the date and the corresponding margin of error when we discuss our recommendations with parents. And how often, at least this is how I was taught, let's wait and, ma and make a decision regarding resuscitation over the withholding of care once we see how the infant looks. Let's de decide then to resuscitate based on how the infant initially responds. At least that I was taught in, in kind of that model. But where's the evidence for such, for such an approach? This is a seminal study in pediatrics that formulated the question into a testable hypothesis. They reviewed the care of 402 infants with birth weights less than 100, 750 grams. APGAR scores at one minutes were used as a proxy for how the infant looked at birth, okay? APGAR is at five minutes a proxy for how an infant responded to initial delivery room resuscitation. They found no correlation between the survivors and the open black dots and the non-survivors and the red dots at one in five minutes. Perhaps we as neonatologists cannot discriminate between a survivor and non-survivor in the delivery room. So in a perfect scenario, our, needs, our, our, our teams need to attend deliveries following that prenatal discussion with family and have arrived at a care plan prior to attending the delivery. This wait and see approach has little to no validity. A final consideration is the hospital setting. You guys are all well aware, uh, well aware of this data, but it's important for us to bring it up today, um, given, given the context. This was a popular ba population-based study from Europe. The authors included 7,000 very low birth weight infants. A large NICU was defined as greater than or equal to 36 very low birth weight infants per year, and a small uh, NICU as less than 36 very low birth weight admissions per year. Large delivery hospital volume defined as greater than 1,000 deliveries per year and a small delivery hospital is less than 1,000 deliveries per year. Compared to the large delivery unit and the large NICU, neonatal mortality was almost two-fold higher in the small delivery unit and the small NICU. This reinforces what we all know about the value of regionalized healthcare in this unique patient population. With that said, I'm going to turn the presentation over um, to my colleague, Dr. Omi. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Uh, thank you, Carl. Let me get my screen set up here real quick. And I want to echo um, Carl's sentiments uh, at the beginning to, and, and extend our gratitude to the, Dr. Sharma and friends for the invite. Uh, we are, you know, quite humbled to be uh, part of these discussions and um, you know, sort of selfishly, 
for us, I think the timing um, is quite good as we are um, ourselves sort of embarking on some internal discussions and projects uh, to really um, look at our outcomes and look at what we do at you know 22 weeks and above and, and really try to optimize our outcomes. So this is a kind of a nice way for us to, to spearhead on our efforts. So, so thank you again. Uh, so I'll start off by you know really discussing you know what sort of guidelines and recommendations exist in the U.S. to help guide some of our decision making and maybe the better question should be do we have any real consistent ones? So most of our major guidelines do continue to be uh, mostly gestational age uh, driven, um, even despite the fact that we recognize there are many other factors that impact survival and that, that, that nothing to say for. You know, the family preferences and cultural um, and religious preferences as well. So this is a table uh, from a recent American College of Obstetricians uh, and Gynecologists and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine uh, consensus statement that breaks down, you know, mostly OB recommendations based on uh, gestational age. Uh, you know, to the far left, um, we have recommendations, you know, below 22 weeks, which is essentially, you know, nothing is recommended. And then at 24 weeks and above, um, really everything is suggested and recommended. Um, but what we really have is sort of that gray zone in the middle, starting at 22 weeks uh, and up where we see there's a little bit of a discordance here. So if you kind of focus on uh, the obstetric measures, uh, really at 22 weeks, really nothing outside of maybe latency antibiotics is recommended. I think the most notable one for us would be you know, the provision of antenatal steroids or not. At 23 weeks, things kind of become more of a consideration, but really at 22 to 22 and six, really nothing is recommended. That being said, if you kind of highlight on the one sort of neonatal um, box here, uh, and that is assessment for resuscitation, there is a consideration at 22 and zero. Now that's being made despite the fact that all obstetric measures that could potentially optimize delivery and potentially optimize outcomes are not recommended. So you can see that there's sort of this scenario where inconsistent or discordant care could be set up. Now, not pictured here, but there's similar recommendations from uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, American Heart Association, and a recent uh, 2014 joint workshop between uh, similar societies where they essentially kind of mirrored the same recommendations. So regardless of which sort of, you know, quote unquote guideline you um, decide to prescribe to, you're still being set up for this inconsistent scenario. Likely a major contributor to this lack of uh, consensus at 22 and 23 weeks is really the concern about potential, you know, high rates of morbidity and mortality in, in this population. So in the next section, we'll review some of that data. I'll try to keep this, you know, neatly split up between mortality and then morbidity, but there'll be a little bit of crosstalk uh, between the two. So in the U.S., you know, outside of regional and institutional uh, reports, which are good and, and are useful, we really rely on two big data networks to get most of our data. So, you know, first we have Vaughn, which I'm sure you're familiar with being a global network. You know, we have 900 plus sites in the U.S. that are partnering. Uh, and in 2019 alone, they captured um, almost you know, 59,000 infants born between 500 and 1,500 grams. And they're very robustly involved both in short-term research, but also in long-term outcomes. And then we also have uh, the NRN or the Neonatal Research Network, which is an arm of the National Institutes of uh, Child Health and Human Development. And they too are very actively involved in a lot of short-term and long-term research. And this encompasses um, 15 large US academic NICUs and, and many more partnering hospitals. So if we jump right in, this is data from uh, 24 NRN hospitals from 2006 and 2011, uh, essentially looking at survival at 22 and 23 weeks, as well as survival without moderate uh, or severe impairment. And, and so right off the bat, uh, I think the study demonstrates differences in outcomes in infants who either receive active treatment uh, or, or not. And I think Carl was the first to kind of use that term and we'll come back to that quite a bit throughout this talk, as you'll see. So you can see notably, you know, survival for the overall cohort of 22 weekers uh, wasn't great and it was only, only 5%. But if you look at the babies that were actually actively treated, so excluding the ones that were comfort care and, and didn't receive any sort of resuscitation, the number does increase to, to 23%. We do see this a similar trend at 23 weeks uh, with improved survival after, after active treatment and also looking at survival without any sort of impairments, that trend also seems to hold true as well, that there is a difference um, in babies that are actively treated. This is recent Vaughn data now uh, from 341 US Vaughn sites. And this was quite a large study. This included over 33,000 babies, a little more recent than the NRN study. This was from 2012 to 2016. They chose to focus on 
survival uh, in relation to really receiving sort of you know full um, after treatment, meaning antenatal steroids in addition to resuscitation. Uh, and sort of the same trend uh, holds true here. We see that there's improved survival um, after, after, after active treatment. Now, it's not pictured here, but if you look at the combined survival for all 22 weekers in this group that received any sort of active treatment, that number was 28.5%. So a little bit better than the NRN data uh, that we just um, discussed. Now, if we move into sort of regional um, and institutional differences, this is a recent study out of California uh, looking at 6,000 infants, 22 to 28 weeks uh, from 2007 to 2011. They too uh, saw similar trends that their overall survival at 22 weeks uh, you know, wasn't great, only 6.4%. But after any sort of resuscitation uh, was given to those infants, that number jumped up to you know, over 30%, you know, very similar to the Vaughn data that we looked at. Now we have the University of Iowa, which we'll talk about quite a bit um, throughout this talk. And, and I'm, sure, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, with some of their outcomes. And uh, certainly in the US, they are kind of a, a leading center and, and overachievers in a sense. Uh, and they too have, have been reporting survival data and outcomes data really since the early 2000s. Now this study was from 2006, 2015, looking at over 240 some odd extremely premature babies. And we can see their survival is quite a bit better than the NRN and, and Vaughn data with, you know, 70% of 22-weekers surviving out to one year and 82% of 23-weekers. Now, I think it's important to note and make that distinction about the University of Iowa is that there's sort of an all-proactive, um, all, all-active treatment center, meaning that, um, you know, they have very high rates of giving antenatal steroids to premature um, um, moms as early as 22 weeks, and then obviously, um, if the parents do desire, uh, they will provide active and, and full resuscitation. So if you look at their data, if you look at what they publish, they don't separate out, um, you know, they don't separate their outcomes by active treatment or not, because essentially everyone is getting act active treatment. And they've been reporting their numbers since the 2000s, early 2000s. And even back then, uh, their outcomes were, were much, um, much better than um, uh, the rest of us. And that has only continued to improve over time. So what is active treatment? You know, I've mentioned this term a lot. Carl, I think, was, uh, was the first to mention it in his slide. And, and why do we mention it? And why is it important? Um, you know, if you, depending, from a research standpoint, depending on the study you look at and the paper you look at, active treatment really can mean any sort of life-saving or life-prolonging um, maneuver. And that's you know, any sort of respiratory support in the VR, surfactant, chest compressions, epinephrine. I think some studies even include parental nutrition, which is obviously outside of the realm of uh, the delivery room. Uh, but some studies may or may not include obstetric interventions. And I do think that's kind of the bigger point that we want to make here. And something we'll circle back to uh, at the end is that I think two things. We sort of know that active treatment, um, actively resuscitating, actively intervening will improve survival to a certain point. And if we're here to talk about, you know, the limits of viability and what are the limits and what are the ethics around those limits and, and what can we do and are we doing everything to optimize and improve outcomes, then I think at the very least, you know, as a field, um, and that includes our obstetric partners, I think we need to talk about what this term really means or what it should mean and what it should encompass so that it carries a little bit more universal meaning. This is a trend we've known about for a while. This is old Vaughn data from 2004, looking at really small babies, 400 to 500 grams, uh, average age about 23 weeks and change. And even back then, when you know, perhaps the care of the extremely premature baby wasn't as you know, sophisticated or as robust as it may be today, even back then we saw that you know, the overall, I think the overall survival rate in the study was 17%, but of those that received resuscitation and intervention in VR and then made it to the NICU, their survival almost doubled to 33%. Recent data out of the NRN shows the same trend. Again, at, at the very limits and very extremes of prematurity at 22 and 23 weeks, we see that active treatment does lead to um, a significant increase in survival versus those that do not receive it. So we've looked at some large multi-center data. We've looked at some individual sites, California, Iowa, for example, and, and clearly we've seen some differences in, in, in the numbers and outcomes and, and, and why is that? I think some of this is probably not surprising, you know, given our lack of consistent guidelines, lack of consistent consensus at, at those very extreme limits. 
but this was a recent study out of the New England Journal of Medicine, and they tried to really go a little bit further and actually quantify those differences. Uh, and they were really looking at um, uh, NRN sites. Again, these are big academic NICUs that, that see a lot and take care of a lot of extremely premature infants. So this is a busy slide. I'll, I'll try to walk you guys through it real fast, but this shows the rates of active treatment by gestational age at birth. And so on the x-axis, you have gestational age broken down by you know, weeks and days, and then rates of active, active treatment. The actual individual point values you see there uh, represent the mean percentage across all NRN centers of active treatment at that um, given gestational age with obviously the, the variance and, and the ranges there. The blue dashed lines, if you can see those, represent sort of the average rate of active treatment um, of all infants across all NRN centers at that gestational week. So again, I think it's pretty clear at 24 and up, essentially all or, or most, if not all, these babies are being actively, treatment, actively treated, and that's, I think, not a surprise. You move to 23 weeks, and, and the majority are still being actively treated, resuscitated, but there is a, quite a bit of variance between centers. And then certainly at 22 weeks, you see that it's really the majority are, are not being actively treated uh, with quite a bit of variance um, among centers as well. I think the interesting thing that also stands out to me is that once you get to that sixth day, that fifth day, that sixth day at 22 and 23 weeks, you can see that really the, the, the rate of intervention sort of jumps up quite a bit. And, and I'm not sure if that's a combination of, you know, practitioners and providers, you know, feeling obligated to sort of round up uh, one week uh, given the, the uh, limitations we know, as Carl spoke about, about dating, or if maybe uh, the obstetric partners are more willing to give steroids closer to, to that, you know, uh, to that end of that week, which then in turn makes us feel a little more, you know, anxious and eager to provide resusc resuscitation or, or maybe a combination of, of the two. Well, what about us? You know, how, how are we doing compared to everyone else, or at least within the U.S.? And so this is uh, from a study we published uh, a couple of years ago, comparing our outcomes at 22 weeks with uh, Uppsala University in Sweden, which has, has long been kind of like a sister NICU to us, and, and we've collaborated with them quite a bit over the years. And so this looked at a total of 72 um, live birth infants at 22 weeks from 2006 to 2015, and, and we had 16 infants who received full proactive, you know, uh, resuscitation and care. 18, which only received inconsistent care, which we defined as either receiving antenatal steroids, but no resusc resuscitation or vice versa. And then the majority or 38 of those infants received comfort care only. So you can see our survival for all of those infants at 22 weeks was only about 8% uh, out to one year. Now, if you take the ones that we actively treated, those 16 that received the full active treatment, that number did improve a little bit to about 19%. Uh, but unfortunately, lagging still behind our counterparts. Now I know Sweden is kind of a you know, one of a, one of many world leaders in this area, so maybe we set the bar a little bit high. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, I think this is a great opportunity for us to learn uh, and improve as well. Now, before we move on from from mortality and survival, I, I did want to talk a little bit about this concept of you know survival over time. And so these are Kaplan-Meier curves um, from our institution, our small baby unit, uh, where we take care of babies less than 27 weeks gestation. It's from 2012. Now at the time, our overall survival rate was about 78%. I'm happy to say that that is over 90% these days. But you can see with the time course of mortality uh, back then, 50% uh, or so of all of our mortality uh, across all gestational ages within our small baby unit had already occurred by 21 days. And the vast, vast majority had occurred by 73 days. Now, certainly if you break this down by gestational ages specifically, yes, the 22, 23 weekers did have um, worse survival compared to their older counterparts. But I think the point is the same that essentially a, a, at a similar time point, the survival rate across the gestational ages kind of becomes a wash, uh, meaning that survival at that point becomes sort, sort of similar moving forward. Now, is this good? Is this bad? You know, I, I'm not sure. I think it reflects a lot of the shared struggles and obstacles that, that all ELBW babies face, those first critical hours, days, weeks, however it may be. But I also think it highlights, you know, sort of low-hanging fruit areas that we can focus on. Um, we sort of know that, hey, most of the mortality will occur by a certain amount of time. That's an area that we can try to focus on and improve, whether that's better collaboration with our obstetric partners, better delivery room management, delayed cord clamping, uh, golden you know, hours, days, weeks, uh, however long you like to stretch that out. I think those are all uh, prime targets. And then that study out of California that we talked about 
they they reported similar findings and, and, and actually they had the same phenomenon happen sooner. Uh, you know, their 22 to 24 weekers, 83% of their deaths had already occurred by the first week of life and, and almost all of them had occurred before the first month of life. So, so I think the point is, is the same that just because you're a 22 or 23 weeker, you're not doomed to die all of a sudden, you know, down the line. Obviously there's, you know, they're a high risk group, the mortality, we know the mortality, there's early mortality and late mortality, but at some point the survival essentially becomes similar across gestational ages. We we'll spent a bit of time talking about survival and the differences there. And so next we'll transition to you know, morbidity and, and some outcomes data. Before we move forward, there's I think a few key considerations and disclosures to really talk about, especially when we talk about outcomes of 22 weekers. A lot of these outcomes are, are a big moving target. And, and the studies you look at, there's usually a lot of the numbers are small and they don't have a lot of data that is stratified based on, on birth weight or by comparing different gestational ages to one another. And even if the data is good quality, a lot of these results do become outdated by the time they're available. This is especially true when we look at long-term outcomes data, since um, this is, there's likely changes in clinical practice that occur more rapidly than the collection and publication of, of long-term data. There's big differences in definitions, and we talked about that with the active treatment or active care or not, and, and some of these models do or do not um, include obstetric interventions. Um, in their definitions. And I think maybe, maybe more importantly, you know, how helpful is this data, you know, right? Do the early morbidities, which we know certainly exist, we know that the risk is high um, in, in some of these babies, do they help us predict, you know, longer, later term outcomes? Do they help us predict quality of life? Do they help us at a minimum talk to families even and, and counsel families? And so because of that, you know, I, I decided to sort of forego diving into each of those outcome studies and go through the nuts and bolts and instead try to sort of maybe keep things on a positive note. And, and again, we'll cir circle back to our colleagues at the University of Iowa and, and, and um, highlight their findings. And again, recalling that they're uh, an active treatment center. They provide steroids early to, to pregnant preterm moms. Um, and so they reported their neurodevelopmental outcomes at 18 to 24 months in all infants born um, between 22 and 25 weeks uh, over a 10 year period. And I think this was almost 250 babies. So they broke this down into percent of patients that had either no or mild impairments, moderate or severe impairments. And they defined this as, you know, hearing impairment, visual impairment, cerebral palsy, and then scores on, on the Bailey three. So pretty remarkably over a 10 year period, they really found those significant differences in the overall rates of either moderate or severe impairment between the babies grouped at 22 and 23 versus those at 24 and 25. Now, the vast majority of these infants had normal vision, normal hearing. I think that the, the really young ones did have a little bit higher rates of cerebral palsy. Um, but impressively, if you look at the 22 weakers specifically, more than half of them were actually classified as either having no or only mild impairment. And if you combine the 22 and 23 weekers as a whole, that number jumps up to 64%. Now, we did talk about their survival rates a little bit previously. Yes, their survival rates of 22 and 23 weeks were a little bit lower than the 24 and 25 weekers, but still, you know, at 70% for 22 weekers, still much higher um, than the other national benchmark data that we just discussed. And, and despite having more survivors uh, at this extreme um, limit of, of prematurity, their cognitive scores and sort of the burden of impairment was really similar at, um, versus those at 23 and, and 24. So, so how do I do it? What's their sort of secret? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit at, at the end. I don't know if it's a secret, but we'll talk about sort of their, what they sort of achieve their success to. Now, if you are interested in, in some of the other outcomes and, and what data is out there, I, I can direct you or I can refer you to a, a large meta review that our group did led by Carl looking at you know, several dozen studies over a couple decades related to outcomes at, at 22 weeks. And so that data is out there if you're interested um, uh, to review it. And so one of the age old questions we have in, in immunology is, well, you know, can we use early data and early outcomes to predict longer term outcomes and sort of that concept of quality of life? And I, I think overall, we have a pretty good grasp on knowing that you know, adverse short and medium term uh, morbidities uh, do lead to um, certain short and medium term neurodevelopmental outcomes. It's, I think, the later, longer, much longer term outcomes that uh, becomes a, a bit fuzzy. And I think the data has shown uh, 
that just looking at gestational age alone is not a good predictor, not a good prognostic predictor for what, what later outcomes will come. And there's a lot of studies that have shown really at once you get much, much older, once these infants get much, much older, things like you know, the maternal education status, the home environment, what sort of stimulus that these babies get exposed to at home actually ends up being more important than, than really all other factors except for the, the most severe cases of, of brain injury, IVH and, and, and PVL. And I, and I don't think this is a, a unique you know, phenomenon with just 22 weekers or 23 weekers. I think this is something to keep in mind for, for a lot of ELBW and BLBW babies. You know, we, we have a saying in our small baby unit and within our guidelines and protocols is that we try to sort of disconnect that short-term morbidity from the longer term outcome. Uh, and obviously what we do in the NICU on a day-to-day -day basis uh, can help do that. So next we'll talk about this concept of discordance in care. And, and, and we saw that very early on with, with those recommendations and guidelines. And, and, you know, I think it's a good question to ask, you know, are we all on the same page? Um, you know, we're seeing more and more babies being born and resuscitated at 22 and 23 weeks, uh, receiving resuscitation, being admitted and, and cared for in, in the NICU. Um, yet we seem to sort of have sort of a lack of real strong evidence um, to sort of point towards more robust um, obstetric involvement, I guess, as it pertains more to, you know, antenatal steroid use. So this was a study out of the Journal of Pediatrics really to try to quantify the obstetric provision of, of steroids and how that corresponds with whether, whether resuscitation is or is not provided. It was a large multi-center study out of the NRN and they looked at over 4,800 babies, uh, 22 to 26 weeks. And so just for orientation, you know, the gray shaded boxes show where resuscitation was provided, but steroids were not given to the mom. And then the, the checkered boxes uh, was essentially the reverse where steroids were given, but resuscitation was, was not provided. And you have you know, gestational aid uh, on the bottom there. And so discordant or what we would call inconsistent care where uh, either one was provided or the other wasn't, uh, was definitely way more common at 22 and I thought kind of surprisingly more at 23 weeks uh, than, than, than you would see at 24, 25, or 26 weeks. Still occurred at those ages where you can see, you know, 10% or less of the time uh, did, did that scenario ever, ever happen. Obviously, I think this is a reflection of our, of our current guidelines. If you break this down into actual trends individually by resuscitation uh, or steroid use, we've seen this chart before earlier in the talk with the variance in resuscitation at different gestational ages, but it's interesting that it kind of mirrors almost identically the rate of steroid administration in, in ages. And again, I think this is uh, a direct reflection of sort of the inconsistencies or, or sort of the vagueness in, in our current guidelines in the US at least as it pertains to steroid administration or, or not. And I think it's not surprising that one mirrors the other as many providers are probably reluctant to provide resuscitation at the, at the extremes of prematurity without the possible benefit of steroids being, being given. The authors also went on to look at um, those infants born at 23 weeks. And if, you, if, if, if we were to adjust the steroid um, administration to moms up to closer to 90%, which is what we see more at like 24 and 25 weeks and up, survival would increase by about 7%, they estimated, and survival without severe impairment by 6.4%. So in other words, at 23 weeks alone, if we were to give more consistent steroid administration, we would definitely improve survival and, and intact survival. Now, I think the big question all of us wanna know is, well, what about 22 weeks? And so in this study, only 22 uh, infants were resuscitated at that age and, and uh, received steroids, so they weren't able to give any good, good estimates. And I think that is, that is the big question and really for the sake of time, um, you know, this question of benefit of steroids at, at the utmost limit or threshold of viability is one I won't be able to dive into a whole lot, but there was one nice systemic review here that looked at um, quite, a bit, quite a bit of studies investigating the use of steroids before 25 weeks gestation. And so if we just focus on death as the outcome alone at 23 weeks here, looking at eight studies, this is over 4,600 babies, the authors did observe a decrease in mortality among those that received steroids uh, versus no steroids in resuscitation uh, alone. Now they did also look at babies 22 weeks. This is just two studies and 587 babies, but they again observed a decrease in mortality among those that received steroids versus those that did not. Now the odds ratio here was a little bit higher than, than 23 weekers and the confidence interval was, was quite a bit wider. So I, so I think it's reflective of just the smaller numbers in general, um, but encouraging, I think, to see. 
Now to wrap wrap this up quickly, um, that systemic that systematic review we just spoke about, they did not include the JAMA PEED study, the Vaughn data that we talked about earlier when we talked about mortality. That came out, I think, the same year, but came out a little bit later in the year. And um, if I'm correct, I think the Vaughn study is actually probably the largest study to date, really looking at the use of steroids at, at that extreme limit of, of viability. And so they saw improved survival across all gestational ages, but specifically at 22 and 23 weeks, you know, with, um, with the provision of antenatal steroids in addition to resuscitation. And actually survival, as you can see here, doubled in the case of 22 weekers. Now, unfortunately, despite this data, that review, and some of the um, you know institutional reports out of Iowa and, and Sweden and other places around the world, I think some of the continued small numbers in some of these studies, I think just the overall concern um, you know about survival and morbidities have made it kind of a slow push um, to really move the needle here in the U.S. at least in terms of you know hey let's let's look at those guidelines specifically with you know, steroid use you know, when's the earliest we should give it to moms. I think we've been kind of slow to really move the needle on that. But I think, you know, this is encouraging data on, at, at a very minimal. I think that those discussions should be brought up again. So this leads me to the last section. And, and you know, after all is said and done, and so we've talked about quite a bit here, you know, what, what do we think works for this population, we sort of you know, talk about Iowa, what do they do that works and what are the take, take home points for some of these places? And so you know, I, I won't read these quotes to you, but these were quotes from some of these papers that we've reviewed that sort of stuck with me. And really, I think the take home point that a lot of these authors all sort of share is that again, that concept of active treatment and not, not so much you know who initiates it or who receives it and when to initiate it, but how do, we, how do we define it and how do we make sure that if we are providing active treatment that we are actually giving the full spectrum of active treatment, including you know, um, optimizing obstetric you know, in, interventions. So if you talk to Iowa or if you read their, uh, read their you know, papers, um, and I don't mean to speak for them or imply that this is like an all exhaustive list, but it, it's, there's three sort of take home points that I feel like they, they repeat often. And, and obviously I think the first is, you know, um, robust obstetric buy-in with early steroid administration, uh, tocolysis to, to stop preterm labor, or at least give you time to give steroids. And then, you know, being very willing to proceed to C-section in cases of fetal distress so that active neonatal treatment can then be quickly initiated to, to optimize outcomes. Uh, regionalization of maternal care, and I have that in quotes because if you talk to them, they'll sort of call this region, regionalization by accident meaning that you know, over the last decade and a half or so, uh, they've had quite a bit of moms in the region and outside of the region really sort of flock to their institution knowing that they are a center that will resuscitate at 22 weeks. And so they've sort of, them and their OB partners have sort of been forced to, to take on this task and regionalize better. And I think the literature is quite clear that delivery at a large regional center uh, does tend to lead to better survival versus delivery at a smaller community uh, in a smaller community setting. And then last and cer certainly not least by any means is this um, you know, top-down hospital-wide you know, positive attitude towards resuscitating this, uh, this population uh, and having standardized care uh, and having protocols uh, and, and continually assessing and, and re reviewing and, and uh, revising those protocols um, and we've seen that in the literature as well, where, you know, centers that, um, and this is true for, for medicine in general, that centers that do something uh, more often, whether it's taking care of 23 weekers or, you know, heart attack victims or what have you, centers that just do it more often tend to get better at it over time, as simple as that may seem. So I think a potential model to, to think about or talk about would be something like this, where uh, less than 22 weeks, obviously, I think knowing the limitations there, you know, comfort care only would be suggested. Uh, conversely, 24 weeks and up, and in many places now that is 23 weeks and up, um, we would need to be kind of a full go there. And so we're left with that gray zone again, uh, that middle zone at 22 and up, um, where we know, um, at least from what we've seen, that you know, outcomes can be reasonably obtained if the right infrastructure is in place. And by reasonable, I mean, you know, similar to what we see currently in 23 and even sometimes 24, 25 weekers. But we also have to realize that this is obviously the highest risk group possible. 
So counseling at that point you know, needs to pull in the parents and have them sort of be involved and you need to sort of um, you know, consider their, their wishes, I think, as well. And so in those cases where I think the parents you know, are, are very clear about not wanting anything done and assuming their intentions are good, then I think that can be respected. And then we have the scenario where obviously, you know, parents want everything done or they defer to us for our opinion. And so I think what we do there is you know, the extent of active intervention depends on predictors, condition and response. And you know, what does that mean? I think really what that means is does that center, uh, center in question, do they have the infrastructure in place to really try to provide everything that can lead to what we know is a, is a potential optimal outcome? So what does that include? You know, essentially everything we just reviewed, right? Um, you know, good OB involvement, early obstetric uh, interventions. You know, is this a center that um, delivers and takes care of a lot of extremely premature babies um, in general? And do they, you know, forget about 22 weekers for a second. Do they take care of a lot of 23, 24, 25 weekers? And how do they do with that? What is the overall staff attitude towards taking on an endeavor like this? You know, um, is there a lot of hesitation among nursing or, or respiratory or any other ancillary you know, group? Are they on board? I think if any, any of those factors are, are missing or lacking or a little bit shaky, then, then outcomes may, may, not be, may not be ideal. And so I think each individual center needs to sort of evaluate those things before you know, deciding on sort of where to draw a line um, proverbially. Um, but again, we know, um, again, we know from centers uh, around the world and that, you know, outcomes can be achieved that are similar to what we already see in 23 and 24 weekers, but um, it doesn't happen overnight. It certainly takes, uh, takes a lot of movement to, to get to that point. And, and this obviously isn't by any means a perfect model. You know, this all assumes that we have the time and luxury to even meet and talk to the family, which obviously isn't always the case. And then, you know, there needs to be some flexibility built into any sort of um, algorithm like this where, you know, if, if there is unfortunately an early catastrophic morbidity where, where comfort care is now potentially an option that, that can be pursued as well. So there are a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts, obviously. So I, I've talked a lot, um, but I do want to thank you all for your time and attention. Um, like I said, we're, we're very quite humbled and, and honored to be a part of this, and, and we're hoping to learn as much from you um, as possible as well. So Carl and I would be happy to take any questions at this time. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, both Carl and Omid for speaking to us today. I think, you know, you've uh, provided, both of you provided an absolutely excellent overview of uh, the active approach to management of uh, babies at this gestation. We, we do have a variety of questions. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, a question that's directed to Carl from one of my senior trainees, uh, who's a grid trainee. So uh, the question that he's asking is, uh, at this particular point of time, uh, we've had a lot of discussion and clearly the quantifiable factors for management that impact prognosis, including antenatal steroids, plurality, sex, and weight are, are quite major kind of factors when it comes to kind of the outcomes for babies. The US obviously has done a lot of research and is doing a lot of research on background and race. And we're just curious at this particular point, you know, is there research available to kind of show that uh, babies of a particular race do better than others? It would be very controversial, obviously, he says, to kind of suggest that we make any decisions based on that. But we're just curious to kind of understand whether that is the case. We've obviously not actually looked at that in the UK. No published data that I can see from Europe either. Um, I, I think it's a great question. There, there's a recent article, on, and I'll share you that with you when, um, when we're finished here, in the Green Journal, so Obstetrics and Gynecology, that looked at across four regions in the United States, um, broken down between Northeast, South, Midwest, and West, um, differences not only in the rates of active resuscitation, but also um, differences in the rates of active resuscitation based on ethnic differences. And they did find, um, and I think it's um, controversial and warrants careful follow-up, they did find differences based on those geographic regions between white, African-American, and Hispanic babies regarding the provision of resuscitation. So um, we're taking those findings very seriously in the United States um, and hope to replicate that study with, with kind of future larger uh, registries. It's a great question. The follow-up question, again, 
from the same colleague is, I mean, do you think there are cultural factors and like we encounter a lot of cultural factors and religious factors while counseling parents from different backgrounds? And do you think that is a significant factor in, in, in that process? I, I do. I think, you know, all of us would have to acknowledge that we, we bring our own biases, if it be implicit biases to that conversation. And so, you know, mechanisms for shared decision making processes are very important for us to kind of move beyond our own biases, provide local, regional and nation, national data um, in an unvarnished setting, and then make sure that, you know, we don't just stop there, but we provide parents with a, a way to understand that data that fits with their, their value systems and their beliefs. And so, um, I think it's it's another important point regarding physician biases in, in prenatal care discussions. So just another question uh, from one of our senior trainees, and the focus here is uh, typically one of our big problems that we've encountered in the UK is uptake of antenatal steroids has, has gone up quite significantly. In fact, we're really good at getting uh, steroids into mothers. I mean, our rates at the moment uh, in, in centers within Wessex for both our tertiary centers and nearly 95%. MagSelf has lagged behind. Now, again, the question about active intervention and defining it is there are varying degrees of active intervention. Do we, you know, we give steroids and MagSelf? Uh, the question then is if, if the parents are unsure about resuscitation or don't want resuscitation and hit 23 weeks, if you don't already have them in and then mom suddenly delivers, the outcome for that kind of dyad becomes poor. So. The question is, do we really need to be a wee bit paternal there, even if parents don't want resuscitation? Should it still be encouraged that we try to get them to have steroids and myself in that context? A, because they may well reach a gestation at which prognosis, I mean, obviously would, would, would improve. But again, the question then is repeat doses of steroids in that context. I mean, over here, uh, what we usually say is that if it's two weeks between courses, would probably recommend a second course if a 22 week ago to 24 weeks and missed out. But we're just curious to kind of get, get an idea from you on that. Um, sure, I, I think we need to disentangle a bunch of, um, you know, decisions that we have with obstetrical providers and with, with families. So um, we don't nearly achieve the success you guys do for convincing our obstetrical colleagues to provide antenatal corticosteroids at, at 22 weeks because they feel sometimes that if they provide it, then that's a mandate on our part to provide resuscitation. So disentangling that if the parents don't uh, desire. Additionally, we're also working to disentangle antenatal corticosteroids in a cesarean section. That does not um, the willingness to provide steroids is not um, us as neonatologists mandating a cesarean section. Thank you. Um, so that, that's an important risk benefit profile that likely is markedly divergent for, for the mother. Um, the cesarean section at 22 weeks likely mandates with a, a classical C-section future pregnancies to be a cesarean section. So my wife, who's an OB, has reminded me of that repeatedly over the years. And so I think Nationally, we're working hard to try to um, have our obstetrical colleagues consider those points separately. To your question about um, how do we communicate with families regarding that decision, I think you know we're working to show them um, that antenatal corticosteroids are, 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 are of tremendous value at 22 and 23 weeks gestation. If they wanna keep the dialogue open for optimizing care, then that's a decision that needs to be made fairly quickly, given that none of us can predict when that child will deliver. And so, um, while I don't know if it's paternalistic is the right word or heavy handed, um, we do encourage um, families that are considering, and I emphasize and underscore considering potential um, resuscitation at 22 to 23 weeks, uh, that antenatal corticosteroids at least keeps the door open for that uh, dialogue to continue. I think completely share the same concept of it doesn't commit the family to necessary resuscitation, but it just ensures that if we reach a point where they change their mind or we're potentially in that kind of dialogue where they, they're even hitting 23 weeks, at least that step of optimization has occurred. I, what about MagSell for 22 weeks? Are you, I mean, over here, we're encouraging it and we're definitely trying to improve and quality improve. That's, you know, irrespective across the board. Clearly for babies who are outborn, we sometimes struggle to get 
you know, an adequate dose in once they're in the process of the mother being transferred. Because a lot of our level two units are desperate to get the mothers here as quickly as possible, which, you know, is not a bad thing. But we're just curious on your experience and have you got any data to show improvement in outcomes? I'm, I'm fascinated that you guys are bringing that up. That's not a consideration that's been widely discussed in the U.S., um, even with close collaborations with some of my obstetrical and MFM colleagues. So that's likely a point that we have you know, not considered enough and probably warrants attention moving forward. But I have no data, at least local or regionally, to suggest either way about, about that. So it's a very interesting point, though. Uh, just a, a question uh, from one of my consultant colleagues, and this focuses around the activeness of management. So active management obviously starts before the baby delivers, but in terms of postnatal management, one of the recommendations from our British Association of Perinatal Medicine was we don't normally recommend compressions. This is a while back. Those recommendations have now been revised. And clearly it's become more individualized. You're really looking at the baby rather than actually making a blanket call on these things. But we're just curious to get your experience. How, how active, I mean, would you say compressions and adrenaline in this situation? Or do you think, and you know, there's quite a bit of data that we've looked at as part of uh, studying in this module, which has been published in Canada, which says the outcomes are quite poor, obviously very few numbers at 22, 23 weeks. But I'm just curious to get your experience. Do you want, do you want to yeah, <clears throat> no, it's a, it's a great question. I think it's, it's an issue or a question that comes up a lot. Um, when we do have the time and luxury to, to meet with families and talk to them and sort of get their wishes and really try to, as uncomfortable as some of these discussions might be to really sort of nail down what the you know, full extent um, of what we can provide may or may not be. So, so we have our own sort of, you know, the NRP, we have our own sort of guidelines for delivery room resuscitation. They're not broken down by gestational age in terms of, you know, do this or not at certain ages. I can tell you, and, and, I'm, not, and I'm not sure if any data exists for this, but anecdotally, I can tell you that um, really at 22, even at 23 weeks, when we talk to families, um, if, if we do think it's going to be a difficult delivery because there's other um, morbidities going on, we do try to sort of um, discuss the extent of what resuscitation will involve and, and what that involves beyond just intubation and, and the potential for, you know, a line and medications and yes, compressions. And so that, that uh, we do try to bring up that point uh, in terms of that's something that they wish to, to um, pursue. Uh, I, I will also say that kind of within our group, um, if we do um, know that a 22 or 23 week baby is imminent, we often will sort of counsel the families that, you know, the, the, on the likely, and I don't want to say futility, but the likely non-effectiveness of compressions at that point for a severely, severely compromised, you know, ELBW. Um, but I also wouldn't say that we rule it out um, across the board for all 22, 23 weeks. I think it's very specific scenarios where we have the time to meet with the family. And we know that this is more than just an extremely premature baby. There's something else. There's high drops. There's some other congenital anomaly, whatever it may be, then I think we really try to sort of piecemeal or, or sort of nail down what the individual components of resuscitation would or would not be, and what our recommendations would be. And if I can just add to that, um, I, I agree completely. You know, we have um, published data that at 23 weeks, what separates them from older, more mature infants is the inability to tolerate um, stresses. And so um, when we looked at our model, um, you know, the ability to tolerate chest compressions, epinephrine was markedly decreased survival rates. And so I encourage, and I'm curious your guys' thoughts of, of the trainees, fellows in the audience. I think, you know, if, if you're having to do chest compressions or epinephrine at 22 to 23 weeks, I would check to make sure your respiratory tube is in the correct right place. Yep. And then, and then if I thought it was in the right place, I would ask my, one of my more senior partners to check it again. Um, because um, I think um, correct placement of the endotracheal tube, um, the provision of adequate pressure to initial to provide initial um, lung lung expansion is is the seminal points in this. And so I've never, just in my ten years of practice, um, been um, forced to provide chest compressions or epinephrine at, at those lower gestational. Areas. 
that's really helpful. Um, in terms of early management delivery room, I mean, at the moment, our data uh, and what we normally do is we annualize it over three years because numbers are 22 and 23 weeks. I mean, to be honest with you, we've just resuscitated four babies at 22 weeks of gestation since the guideline has come up in 2019. So we're in our infancy, but clearly management of 23 weeks is quite proactive and our three year averages for survival are pretty high. They're about 86%. I think the question we were asking is, for babies at 20 to 23 weeks, we tend to leave our central lines in quite long. You know, the UVC that goes in stays in for a good seven to eight days. We start aggressive parental nutrition within the first six hours, very high concentrations of dextrose. We, we're using about, you know, in the range of starting with 15, going up to 18 pretty quickly by day three. We've had a real problem with UVC extravasations in this group of babies. And uh, I mean, we've been collecting data for the last 10 years now, and, you know, we've had about 26 cases, predominantly in extremely preterm babies. Diaphragms is another group which we find is quite high risk. We're just curious to get your experience. I mean, do you switch to peripheral percutaneous nutrition uh, or do you use central nutrition via a pick line early? Uh, or are you keeping your umbilical catheters in for an extended period of time? I'm just curious to see what the practices are. Yeah, no, I, I think we have sort of the opposite concern sometimes in trying to get that uh, umbilical line out as soon as possible. I think seven days is kind of our, our, our average, or the number we shoot for as well. And um, we're very proactive about just getting a pick line in uh, sooner than later if we foresee any issues with the umbilical line. Um, we tend to have, uh, lately at least, we've tend to have more issues with, with skin yep. and keeping the line in place uh, and sort of the surrounding skin um, region. That seems to be more of, a, of our issue. Um, but our focus is, is really on central line infections and, and trying to get that umbilical line out as so, sooner than later. Um, there are scenarios where we keep it in a little bit longer if, if just we don't have the ability to get access uh, or uh, other central access, or if we've tried and not, and not succeeded. But uh, I think generally we're, we're pretty good about getting it out by day seven and getting a pick line in. And, and we do the same with, with sort of aggressive you know, nutrition and, and early, you know, early nutrition, early lipids, um, early uh, enteral feeds, uh, really more than anything. Uh, to get that process started as well. Caffeine use, uh, I mean, we're obviously, we're becoming a little bit more circumspect. It used to be blanket uh, caffeine for all, but most of our babies at that gestation are tubed. I'm going to be really honest to say that more than 90% of our babies, uh, you know, I think in the last two years, we probably bought one 24-week CPAP. Everybody else has had intubation surfactant. Uh, early caffeine and early extubation where possible. Obviously, high risk factors necessitate a little bit more caution if you're perinatally asphyxiated or septic. Just curious about your early golden hour management and what, what that looks like for those babies. And do you think babies at 22 and 23 weeks need to be treated differently to the 7, 800 gram babies at 25 weeks? Do you think they're a completely different group and do we need to be treating them quite differently to those babies? I'm just curious again. Oh, yeah, all, all great. I can see Carl smiling because these are all questions that we sort of have or have had recently amongst ourselves as well. Uh, I think for your first question, you know, we give caffeine to all of our all of our small babies really without question. And we're very um, we're very proactive about reloading with caffeine yep. and, and rapidly increasing up to about 10 milligrams per kilo per day and sometimes even higher than that. So we're very liberal with our caffeine use. Uh, and we're actually we're very um, I would say we're pretty good about um, early uh, extubation attempts. Uh, we do have like an extubation protocol that we try to follow in terms of weaning and what sort of goal settings we like to be at before an extubation attempt is considered. Uh, but it's in it's really sort of highlighted in all of our protocols for an early extubation attempt within the first 24, 48 hours, if possible. And if that doesn't succeed, then we try again within five to seven days. So that, that really has been kind of a, um, a highlight or a focus of our program for quite some time to get that, that tube out as fast as we can. Um, as for your second question, yes, I do, um, I do, <clears throat> and I think Carl would agree. I do think, you know, the 22, 23, certainly 22 weeks, but if you want to lump 23 weeks in that, I think that's also reasonable that they are sort of a special subgroup where we're actually looking at devising our own, uh, we have, you know, we have our own small baby guidelines, but we're looking at devising sort of a, a subgroup of guidelines, certainly for those 22 and even 23 weekers with special attention to detail. I think the issues like skin and, and, and thermal regulation, humidity, uh, certain nutritional, um, you know, um, variances. So yes, I would agree that they are a, a special subpopulation that, that um, they deserve a, a specific, unique approach. 
And we'd be more than happy to share our guidelines and vice versa. We'd love to, to see yours because um, we're, we're still learning in this process as well. I think for us, skin is a major issue. Uh, I mean, we interestingly, we manage very high humidity levels in the, you know, I, I'd say for a good four or five days, you know, achieving a lot of rain out is, is kind of seen as good rather than bad because it means that, but we see a lot of hyponatremia in our babies as well high sodiums and I mean that's something that is a cause for worry in our group of babies. Uh, we've obviously tried to cut down on flushes, things like that, but I mean just in terms of your experience with these babies, electrolyte imbalance and high sodiums, high potassiums, I mean high potassiums we usually don't have such a big problem with, you know they will rise, we're pretty circumspect and you know seven and a half doesn't worry us over here, but do you think we should be worried about that? We, we see the occasional um, real severe hypernatremia, and I think it's in, in that population with just such immature skin and, and such bad insensible losses despite us. And usually we try to keep the humidity about 80% the first couple of days. Uh, we'll push it a little bit higher if we can, but you know, the rain out obviously, as you mentioned, can be a little bit counter counterproductive. Yep. Um, we don't want to see the potassium issues a whole lot. Um, that hasn't been, unfortunately, an issue, but I, but I think really just in the, the real severe skin cases, the sodium does become an issue. You know, I'm curious if, um, <clears throat> if any of the speakers you've had, from, if you've had any speakers from Japan lately or not. You know, I spent some time there a couple of years ago touring their NICUs and, and they're, you know, they, they, um, they really like to tout uh, their, their uh, incubators and they can really achieve almost 100% humidity with very little to no rain out and with a certain special type of incubator that they use. And I think they, they really attribute a lot of their, um, you know, electrolyte management and, and, or lack there or lack thereof in terms of issues, I think, to, to their special incubator use. I'm not sure if they present it to you guys or if that's something. Uh, so not quite. So we've got Professor Namba who works at the Saitama Medical Center. So he's going to be presenting to us at the end of the month. Again, it completes a kind of an overview of having experts like yourself, uh, Magnus from Sweden, and then kind of the Japanese approach, again, just trying to look at practices because clearly we want to improve. But more importantly, I think we realize, you know, we're at the start and the beginning of a, a long journey, which, you know, we'd, we'd like to produce the best outcomes for our babies. Uh, one other question, I mean, we're a center which has high late onset sepsis rates. Now, to give you an idea, our late onset sepsis rates, especially in this group of babies, has been as high as 10 per thousand nine days, you know. Uh, compared to other centers in Vaughan, as well as centers in the UK. I mean, we have centers in the UK who've achieved three. And I mean, we, we're aggressive on nutrition. We keep our lines in. I mean, the average duration for a long line in an extreme preterm 23, 24 weeker, I'd say the median is about 28 days. Again, just comparing practice. I mean, are there any quality improvement strategies that you've used? We, we have bundles. We obviously, we've tried using the matching Michigan, but I think the lack of staff and the, the ability of nurses and doctors to be able to do lines, you know, one-on-one -on -one nursing is a real challenge for us. It's, it's really one and two over here in the UK, even in our unit, which has about 150 nurses. So, you know, I, I'm just curious to think, you know, your management and lines and sepsis, anything that we can learn from you, especially considering skin, you know, skin is a major problem with our lines. I mean, we, we were using Tegaderm to put our lines in in extreme preterms, and we had a real issue with just the ability to secure those lines, keep the Tegaderm intact with the high humidity. So we've moved to using Opsite. The problem with Opsite and skin, it's, it's not great. So we're just curious to... Yeah, no, I think we have a lot of the same focuses, you know, getting the central line out early, extubation early, um, uh, using mom's milk when possible, a lot of don donor breast milk use if, if we can. Um, I'm not sure what our current rate is for, for late onset. I know we've, uh, we've recently sort of had kind of a, a rash of, of central line infections recently, which we're looking at. But our, our focus has always been on those sort of big three, you know, getting all the stuff out of the baby that we can and really focusing on early um, enteral nutrition with, with mom's milk or, or donor milk if we can and, and going from there. Skin is an issue. I think skin has always has been a big problem for us. You know, we, we have, uh, we're lucky to have, uh, you know, we have a, a wound team um, that focuses on, on, on skin issues, even in this population. And so the, they're, they're very actively involved in a lot of these babies that have early issues. 
Um, but that, that, that is, I think, a, a common struggle for us as well has been the skin integrity, especially with relation to, to when there's presence alliance and trying to keep them secured as well. And your approach to postnatal steroids, uh, again, quite diverging approaches between us and our sister unit who manage babies. I mean, traditionally, they've, they've been a unit who is not keen on using postnatal steroids early, grow the baby, good nutrition, whereas from our perspective, again, the, you know, the tendency to want to get the baby off the vent means we probably bail out second or third week. And I'll be really honest to say, I think having just recently looked at our three-year data, 80% of our babies in that group of 23 weeks and 24 weeks now going down to 22 weeks is having postnatal steroids. I'm just curious to, again, just get your experience and... Yeah, we don't use a whole lot. Of, uh, I'm assu I assume you mean for extubation, and right. for, uh, so for BPDF. like a dark protocol. Um, correct. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't use a whole lot, um, and it's um, it's not even built into our guidelines. Uh, not saying that we don't use it or that it's you know frowned upon. Certainly, there are instances that we use it, uh, and I, I would say you know we um, for most of us that's usually around the four to six week mark. If for baby that's really stuck on the ventilator on pretty aggressive settings, and, and even then there's many of us that still wouldn't do it. You know, we've seen from our own data that, you know, once we can get a baby up to full feeds and get the central line out, that we essentially know that baby is going to survive. Yeah. And I think we also have the luxury of having a very robust BPD unit literally down the hallway from our main NICU. And, and, we, and, and, and they, if they get involved as early as 34 weeks gestation and they can, we can transfer babies over there as early as 36 weeks gestation. So, so we know that, you know, if we can do everything else sort of, you know, quote unquote, correctly, and optimize everything else. Um, uh, yes, we may have, uh, and we do have fairly high rates of, of BPD here. Uh, we know ultimately that that baby will survive. And, and, and even our uh, most severe BPD cases, uh, most of those babies tend to um, have fairly good outcomes down the line anyways. And so I don't think we get so caught up on, on the use of, of steroids, but it, but it does happen um, and now and then. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it, it's it's few and far between, I'd say, that we, we do a DART protocol or, or not. And and usually we won't, we'll only do it once. Yeah, We won't repeat it. We won't do multiple courses. And, and if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then we sort of, I hate to say, but we sort of resign ourselves to the fact that, you know, this baby is on the road to BPD, but and we'll kind of focus on everything else at the time and, and, and deal with that down the line. So uh, just a question from one of my colleagues, Charu, who's a consultant in one of our level two centers. So again, with resuscitation at that gestation, are you seeing higher rates of IVH as compared to the bigger babies or NEC, say for example, as comorbidities? Uh, I mean, traditionally our NEC rates have been quite low in the range of less than 1% in that group, but we have a breast milk bank and we do a lot of donor breast milk, which obviously the nutritional quality of which is hotly debated at the moment as being inadequate. But just again, curious from your perspective, just once you started resuscitating more of those babies, have you seen a rise in those morbidities as compared to the bigger lot or? Yeah, uh, not a whole lot. Our, our, our neck rates have been pretty consistent around four to 5% for several years now. And that really has not changed a whole lot. And then uh, obviously with 22 weekers, we've only had, again, as I showed in that slide, about 70 some odd babies. Um, so not, not a lot of numbers to go off of, but for 23 to 24 weekers, our, we have not seen a big rise in, in, in severe IVH or, or PVL. Um, and so that, that really fortunately has not been an issue that we've had to deal with in terms of you know, rapidly escalating IVH rates. We, we have not seen that. And I, and I, think, um, I think a lot of that is due to, um, we have pretty consistent resuscitation guidelines that we follow for, for our small babies with respect to you know, handling and, and, and whatnot. And then I think we are all pretty good in terms of being consistent with our guideline, our small baby guidelines. Not, not saying that they're perfect or the best out there, but I think we're consistent in what we do. We continually reassess and, and change and, and evolve if we need to. So we have not seen an, a bump in our severe IVH rates for, for that uh, population. So a major problem for us is uh, obviously the challenge of nursing staff and that's been raised, you know, in terms of being able to provide one-on-one -on -one care. Our golden hour is probably not a golden hour to be quite honest. It's probably a golden few hours, uh, you know, considering the condition of the baby staffing. Now, how strict are you about that is one of the questions from one of our trainees in terms of uh, managing the babies, handling versus, you know, getting lines and things like that in. 
for some of our babies, I mean, we've adopted, especially if they're cold, or if we think the skin is really a problem, we put a peripheral in, and then we'll do lines in a slightly delayed way in controlled circumstances. But we're just curious about your experience. Yeah, I think that's one area we can also get better at is, is golden hour and or hours or days or golden week even, uh, however long you'd like to extend that out. Um, you know, we, we have it written in, in some of our, um, you know, documentation in terms of, you know, um, we would try to focus on getting the line in quickly, get, you get nutrition started early. And, and, and we, do, we do very explicitly state in terms of minimal handling, positioning for the first, you know, three days or so. Uh, we try to stick to that. We try not to open the incubator a whole lot. So we try to stick to that in terms of uh, really sort of the, that minimal handling. I think that has helped um, keep our IVH rates, as you had asked previously, I think keep that sort of uh, where, where it's at. Um, staffing, I think, is a universal issue in terms of nursing. We do have, at least at our main campus, we do have sort of a core team of small baby nurses. Um, it, it's sort of, you know, I think we need more um, you know, certain, uh, some of our assignments, you know, obviously the sickest of the sick babies, you know, will be one-to-one, -one, but um, uh, some of those more sort of convalescing or sort of transitioning babies, we do get stretched in a little bit with nursing. Um, so I think that's, that's an ongoing issue for us as well, just to kind of have that a big enough team uh, of nurses to, to, to dedicate. But that's one area that we've been trying to build towards and recruit more, more small baby oriented nurses. So this is a question for Carl. So Carl, uh, the intercenter variability in the states i mean it, it prevails in the uk as well a really nice paper from neil marlow which basically looked at the north south divide but uh, the question is how do we get over that because that obviously there's a degree of fairness there then you know a parents really getting what they expect in their minds so and i mean for us we're a much smaller nation the uk but i mean the states is massive so are there any strategies that you're adopting any kind of initiatives that look at trying to standardize management a little bit more in terms of how you're doing active care in particular? Um, so I, I think that that points to, you know, what kind of data do we provide families? And so recognizing the wide variance, we've made a concerted effort to provide families our local data so yep. they understand what's going on at Nationwide Children's and the surrounding hospitals, regional data, and then we look at the na national data. Um, and so we've, we've really made a concerted effort to try to include all three. Sometimes that can be overwhelming for uh, families. Sometimes parents want even more data than we're providing. Um, but recognizing the wide variance across um, centers, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, we've taken it upon ourselves and encouraged other centers to, to understand all three levels of data to, to provide for parents. That's really helpful. Again, that's a very similar approach. We we usually do our three year averages and clearly survival for our, us at 23 and 24 weeks is higher than the national average. I mean, for our sister unit at Portsmouth, it's even higher than us. And clearly being able to reflect on that data uh, versus the national data means you, we're able to tease out some of those issues. In terms of counseling parents, I mean, the approach that you take, usually in our setup, it will be a consultant. Uh, and an obstetrician, we strive to try and do it together. I'm going to be honest to say, often the obstetricians with the busyness have already had those discussions. Now, obviously, that then can sometimes color how things have been. We, we clearly have a, a kind of a checklist that we use to try and iron out. And in that checklist, clearly, some of the optimization strategies are discussion of steroids, MagSelf, trying to get them in as quickly as possible, considering chorioamnionitis, does it need treatment? Has it been treated? But I'm, I'm just curious to kind of get a feel for your approach in those situations. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you guys are already ahead of the curve in just um, simply having a joint conversation when you can with your obstetrical providers and then going through a checklist. I don't think many of the centers in the US have that level of collaboration on this discussion of 22 and 23 weeks with obstetrical providers, nor do they come um, and discuss with families with, um, you know, checklists or decision aid guides as some as the CHOP group has shown us the value of decision aids um, and kind of formulating that discussion around a, a more consistent approach. I think that's something that I'm embarrassed that we haven't done better with at Nationwide Children's because, you know, still, although we have this appearance of a uniformity, you know, it's still, there's biases within our group um, that I think is, um, 
I think that's apparent at a lot of major academic hospitals where um, there are differences of opinion on how best to handle these patients. So I think one of our aims over the next five years is to, like we've mentioned before, acknowledge those biases by looking at the available data and then try to frame the discussion with parents um, devoid of those biases in a way that they can understand. I think you guys are fantastically humble. I mean, I'm going to be honest enough to acknowledge we don't even have that data yet. I mean, how do I go back to parents with four babies resuscitated in my unit and give them a view? Our embrace data, which clearly has, is, it's a mere worth of data. And, you know, when you actually tease out the numbers, we're really talking numbers in, you know, double figures under 20. So I think it's a challenge. And that's where I would say that, you know, a lot of us are heavily influenced by the work that you guys are doing. I think uh, we've, we're really keen to kind of look at our practices because clearly the knock-on impact for higher gestations doing better is also really important for us. And I think, you know, that, that's where with the start of our journey, I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both of you today for, you know, giving us an absolutely fantastic overview, uh, a lot of food for thought for our group, some of whom are actually doing projects in particular quality improvement projects in this area in particular to try and improve, uh, you know, our antenatal coverage of MagSelf in particular, but again, postnatally, just ensuring that our babies, uh, you know, are, are we're trying, um, um, we, we still have a long journey in trying to iron out that we can get a standard number of members to the team with standardized roles. We've, we've tried to focus on pre-resuscitation huddles. We, we use equipment trays, which kind of means that TABC is organized for the right-handed person in a clockwise manner. So we've been able to standardize a lot of those things. But I think the challenge still is, like you said, it's the difference in opinion and how prepared you are, you know, for, for that mother who walks through the door with bulging membranes and trying to produce the best outcome for those babies. Uh, I'm just quickly going to ask my colleagues whether there are any last questions, but any other pearls of wisdom that you'd like to give us? I, I just have a, I, I did have a question. Um, and we talked about IVH rates and, and just outcomes in general. Um, you know, one thing I forgot to mention that we do quite a bit is uh, we're uh, very pro um, giving in the methicin after, after birth, prophylactic the methicin. I know that's kind of a contentious issue. Uh, certainly with our, <laughs> within our group, there's still discussion even to this day. Uh, but we do have some data out of our institution showing that for you know, all the outborn admitted small babies that come to our unit, um, the provision of uh, prophylactic methicin has led to improved survival, not so much with IVH reduction, but just improved survival overall. Um, and I think we, we're re reanalyzing that data because, again, I think we have some, 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 some little bit of internal doubt as far as that's concerned as well. But I'm not sure if that's something that you guys did or do or have any strong thoughts towards. I think... Probably uh, anxieties around it. I mean, I'm just sharing our view on the, because we're a surgical unit and we worry about the risk of perforation. I think prophylaxis completely, we've, we've never considered it. But the only other thing is we do use prophylaxis for hydrocortisone under 28 weeks. And just the combination of using both of them would really worry us in terms of increasing the risk of perforation. I think the one thing that we've done is we do cheat. So when we talk about our NRC, NEC rates being low, we exclude spontaneous intestinal perforation into a separate group completely. And our SIP rates are, they're surprisingly higher than our NEC rates. And again, because we've seen that, uh, we've, we've been slightly anxious and we, we don't use endomethacin, but we have implemented hydrocortisone recently. And we're using it uh, in the, the Premilog dose. Again, because our BPD rates, three-year averages are about 45 to 55%. At the moment, 45, a little bit better. But that, that's massive compared to centers in Vaughan. Yeah. And that's babies under 1,500 grams. Uh, I think that's all my colleagues uh, have asked. And we're so grateful. I, I, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, trust me to say that, you know, uh, I've been born and brought up on some of the papers that you guys have published, uh, again, uh, as well as, you know, heavily influenced by the importance of being able to consider active management. So, you know, it, it's, it's, an, it's an absolute honor to have both of you speak to us today. And uh, I, I think what I'd like to do is thank you on behalf of our neonatal unit, uh, our network, as well as the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, the feeling is mutual. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe.